Let's go over it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, no matter how skeptical you are, would you accept that for us to even like to do anything, there has to be existence? Existence of us? Just existence? Sure, yeah. Okay, so that's the first premise. There is existence. And everything needs to be relative to each other for one to be existing. One even exist. before we jump to that, okay. just the mere fact that there is existence. Mm. So that's premise number one. Premise number two, that the that there is uniformity, regularity, and stability in nature. And what I meant by this, which is what one Oxford professor uses as an example as well, he had a bottle up and he said, what's to stop, what's to stop this bottle from randomly exploding, combusting, floating, disappearing. Yeah, I remember you telling me about exactly. this last time, yeah. Yeah, so it makes sense for us to do science, for us to go home, for us to look around, for us to even watch the news. Otherwise, instead of us having breaking news every hour, there would be breaking news every minute. Yeah. Because the Big Bang would have disappeared. Uh, this railing that you're leaning against would disappear. Grass would disappear. Everything would disappear. Sometimes trees would come into existence. Sometimes the tree would disappear. Yeah. So the mere fact that we have uniformity, regularity and stability, that much we need to agree on in order to not only do science, but in order to live our life. Do you sure. agree? Yeah. Okay. So premise one was existence. Premise two was the URS. So therefore, there is an existence that explains this uniformity, regularity and stability of nature. Does that make sense? Sure. An Good. existence of God? Just existence. Existence. Yeah. yeah. So far, what we're going to do, we're going to scaffold on this. Okay. Yeah. 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 So this is what we did last time. So you accepted that there is an existence that is responsible for the uniformity, regularity and stability of nature. Yeah. So this is a lo logical syllogism, just a one, two, three. Yeah. So now we know that there's, there is an existence. Okay, cool. Now, if there is water in this bottle, yeah, can I create a watch? From the water? From water. No. No. Can I take out a leaf from this water? No. No. Why can't I create a watch from the water inside the bottle? Well, because the watch needs different parts. It needs different parts. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that if you are making something then you should have those characteristics yourself as well yeah so if it's making a watch if a watch is emerging it should have those component parts already in there yeah yeah excellent so would you agree that there is consciousness there is will and there is power when you look around consciousness subjectively like me yeah um I'd like to believe that, but no, I don't think there is. You don't believe there is consciousness? No. You don't believe that you're conscious? Well, what does that mean exactly? Self-aware. Self-aware of myself? Sure. Yeah, but so that's, that's consciousness. Yeah. Bare bones. Bare bones consciousness. Yeah. You believe there's power? So if I was to push you, you can hold your own weight and you can push back? Do you believe that yeah. exists? Yeah. Okay. Do you believe there is will? That we have an element of choice? with regards to the acts that we do? Sure. Okay, so if these are the three components that are in creation, then the existence that we refer to should also have power, should also have consciousness, and should also have will. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, great. So now we've established there is an existence. This existence has consciousness, it has power, and it has will. Now, you could be saying, okay, but that could be other things, no problem. Now, here, I'm going to switch it up a little bit, yeah? Let me make the statement first. You cannot have an infinite regress of dependent things, yeah? So you are dependent on something else, something is dependent on something else, yeah. yeah. So eventually, would you agree that this dependency has to stop somewhere? Otherwise, otherwise, there will be an infinite regress and we technically, I mean, it doesn't make sense for us to exist. Well, is there an infinite progress? Infinite regress. But, but is there an infinite progress? Infinite, not, for, for the necessary being, yes. For the dependent things, no. Let me illustrate this point. Maybe okay. we're going on a tangent and maybe yeah. you can bring me back. Like, if I am going to throw this bottle at Jabi, yeah? Yeah. Now, for me to dash this bottle at his head, yeah? 
right in the temple, I ask Daud, can I do it? Yeah. Before I do it. And then Daud has to ask your permission. You have to ask his permission. He, and we go infinitely. Will I end up throwing this ball? No. So there has to be an end. There has to be somebody who says yes. Then they pass the yes on. Yes, 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 yes. And they come to me. Then I throw it. Agreed? Yes. So likewise, when it comes to dependent things, this is something which is known as a contingency argument, also known within philosophy. There's many different kind of uh, shoots of it. But very simply, you cannot have an infinite regress of dependent things. Otherwise, you and I, we wouldn't be you know, existing and we wouldn't be able to converse today. Yeah? So, in philosophy, we say, look, infinite regress has to end with something that is necessary. So, necessary is something that starts off that chain. Does yep. that make sense so far? Yeah, yeah. Good. So, we've, we've acknowledged and accepted there is an existence. We've given it at least three attributes. And we've also acknowledged that it is necessary, i.e. it's the first, yeah? yeah. And itself, it can be in any other way. Yeah, it can't be any other way. And of course, it's existing pre-eternally. Like it can't just pop into existence, otherwise it would be dependent on something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So in philosophy, it's like axiom you have in mathematics. Yeah. 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 In order for you to do mathematics, you need to have an axiom. Yeah. So in order for there to be creation... The yeah, you need to have, yeah, you need to have a necessary being. So this necessary being is the beginning through which others have come. Yeah? So because he is infinite, we are finite. So he chose to create us at a certain time, which indicates that he has will. Because if you are infinite and you've created something in time, then it has to indicate will. And like he said, can't be any other way. The universe, if you can agree that the universe can be any other way, then the universe is dependent. What do you mean by certain time then? Like... So time, so if God is, well, God is infinite. Yeah? Okay. The ne well, necessary being is infinite. With us, we were created at a moment, isn't it? Because if we're created and we're linked to time, that's the moment. When it comes to the necessary being, he's been there for eternity. There is no beginning point. So time and space don't necessarily affect him. Okay. With me so far, yeah? Sure, but I, I'm confused because time needs to be relative to something else. If there's nothing before, then what is, exact, well, what it, is it exactly? It, it depends. Like, our understanding is very limited. Yeah. And it's very reliant upon the current understanding of science that we have. And the current understanding of science that we have tells us that the Big Bang happened and that was the beginning of time and space. Yeah. yeah. So, before the Big Bang, we don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We science scientifically, we don't know. Yeah, what was the nature of the space? What was the nature of time? No problem. Yeah. However, we can agree philosophically, no matter where the science takes us, there has to be a necessary being. He has these characteristics. Yeah. So, for us, whatever I've described so far, yeah. we just label it as God. Yeah. So in, in the Quran. Our pH test for God is He is one, He is everlasting and eternal, He does not beget nor is He begotten, and there is none like Him. So what you're saying is, because we don't know what exactly happened, we're just going to label it as, as God? No, no, we have like, less, like sufficient indications okay. to pinpoint and say this is, this is God, because there's, again, will, uh, intent, and all these things. In the even, even with the Big Bang, bear in mind, Big Bang happened at a specific time. Yeah, what we're saying is, the argument that we're making transcends Big Bang. Mm. Like, it doesn't matter whether you have string theory, M theory, Big Bang, or steady state theory, that's, that's irrelevant. Mm. Because our argument still stands. Sure. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying, that it doesn't matter whether it's Big Bang, it doesn't matter if it's steady state, that doesn't change that there is a necessary being, yeah. and that the necessary being has these characteristics. Um, and, and this is us in, in relation to the necessary being. Yeah? So, am I good to move on that, that now we obviously call that necessary being God? Now you tell me how do you feel about that? What, do you, what are you thinking? Go ahead. Um, 
Well, I, I can't really deny it because my, my knowledge about it is not as good as yours, of course, because you've studied it. Fair enough. So uh, I think um, I need to do a little bit more research to be able to like completely formulate my idea on it. Um, but I do know um, with religion that I don't think I'll, I'll ever believe in, in religion because what you're doing is you base your um, like beginning ideas on logic and then the rest is just faith, which is the complete opposite of logic. No problem. We can discuss yeah. that and we will discuss that. I'll gladly discuss that with you. Yeah. But in order to do anything, sometimes Nick, what you have to understand is when a person says, I would never believe in this, I would never do that, there's always a reason. And according to my kind of anthropo not anthropo an anthrop anthropology based um, studies, there's always a reason. And that reason won't always be something which is factual or rational. It may sometimes be something which is experiential, or it yeah. might even be something that's emotional. Yeah, that a person's picked up. So, what I would say, and I would hope, is stay as open-minded as you can mm, yeah. as we go through this. Look, sure. If, if for example, you bring something, I'm willing to reconsider it. Yeah. yeah. But for you to knock it down without hearing it, I would say, don't let anybody decide that for you, Nick. Whether it's society, whether it's your experience, or whether it's your emotions. Keep yourself open to it. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's excellent. So, we've got a necessary being. Now, we've given it characteristics. Now, this is what you had an issue with last time, and then we can uh, help him with this. Which is, how do you then go from God, to then human beings, to then books, to then prophets? Yeah? Now, when you look at science, Nick, most of science relies on empiricism. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. However, faith, as, and as Muslims, we don't just rely on empiricism. We'll take empiricism, we'll take philosophy, we'll take rationality, and we'll take ontology. So you see the four with the one. Yeah. Yeah? But then an offshoot of science, you can say induction and all of this, yeah? Induction, testimony, that sort of stuff. Yeah. So the thing, I guess what I'm trying to say, Nick, is there will always be a level of faith that will be required. Because if you've seen something, then Islamically, according to Islamic theology, it doesn't make sense for it to be called a test. There is no accountability yeah. because you've seen it. You've seen me now. Mm. For somebody to come to you and say, oh, he doesn't exist. You have to think that that's absurd. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Like, I've seen him. Yeah. And some say, I'm going to test you now, Nick. Oh, does Zishan exist? Yes or no? So test is, I'll give you a thousand pounds. You're like, he's the easiest thousand pounds. He does exist. <laughs> yeah. Give me the thousand pounds. Yeah. You see, so conceptually, this is... This is it. There's a test, but Nick, rationality and faith is not only something that's asked of religion, it's something that's asked in life as well. Yeah? You getting up in the morning, you have faith that the sun will rise again. Yeah? You getting up in the morning or you doing science, you have faith that the electrical systems and the wires will continue flowing with electricity because copper continues to conduct electricity. Well, because it's happened before, so I know that, that it should happen again. It should so happen again. It would, maybe, happen again. I can't prove that it will. Okay, exactly. Like, if I wake up and my phone is just dead, and, you know, I don't know if it will or won't. Exactly. That's the yeah? problem of induction. Okay. That's the problem that science has. Yeah? That, technically speaking, if you just rely on science, you are going to struggle to prove based upon four things. Mm -hmm. Number one, science falls prey to the replication crisis. Yes. yes, yes, yes. You cannot replicate Eight. the experiments. scientific experiments. Yeah. Amgen uh, did this, and there's a biotech firm, and they noticed that only 11% was able to be rep replicated. So one, you got the replication crisis. The other one, okay. you have induction. Yeah, induction, which we just discussed. Third one is interpretation of results. Like, how am I interpreting wow. this result? Wow. Am I using linear uh, or Bayesian probability? Am I using the linear uh, kind of, um, you know, correlation? You know, when you did this at school, all the X's are pointing right direction, so we draw a line of best fit. Mm -hmm. And lastly, paradigm shifts. Yeah, the point that I'm trying to say is, in order for you and I to do science, we have to accept induction. And induction, you 
can't prove it using science. Yeah. 90%, I would say, it went up from before. I said about 85%. It got, it's gone up now. Okay. Science depends on testimony. Yes, yes. Most of the science that you will read or you will hear, it's exactly that. You're hearing or reading from a book, you're hearing from a professor, you're watching a documentary. Yes, that person may be well-known, high level, but you're taking their word for it. Like, I don't know if you've seen this movie called Catch Me If You Can. Yeah, yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, 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 yeah. That guy was really, he would just walk in to a class and the way he'd convince the other person that he was the teacher was convincing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, even your teacher technically relies on testimony. And I would even argue, Nick, your mother, being your mother, solely relies on testimony. I'll prove that to you. Okay. Have you ever done a DNA test to prove that your mother's your mother? No. But you accept it, right? Sure. Yeah. Based upon? Um. She said it. Testimony and the people around also agree as well. And you experience. And that's something also that science doesn't uh, factor in. Experiential um, uh, engagement in the, the everyday world, you know. This is something that the um, anti-positivists, and these are people who are against empiricism, themselves being very scientific themselves, they have problems with the things that you've, made, um, you've mentioned. That empiricism or, or, or even like all these things have limitations. And you know what is so beautiful? They mirror the human condition so well. It's like testimony. It's still a thing, even amongst scientists who love to be so objective. You know? Sorry for No, 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 go for it whenever you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to say yeah. something? Yeah. Um, no, go, go ahead. Yeah, you sure? Yeah. Okay. So, the point that I'm trying to say, Nick, is for us to just live our life there is always and there will always be a level of faith and but the thing is there's two levels of faith yeah and there's different degrees just like i can say yeah. i have money when i have one p you can say you have money when it's five pounds you can have you can say you have money and you have a hundred thousand pounds yeah we all have money yeah. i only have one p <laughs> yeah. so even with faith this is why i said the inference to the best explanation as a human being what explanation makes the most rational sense and that should be a good starting point for us if we say look this is all based upon faith then technically your whole life will fall apart because you can't take science you can't take testimony you're going to go home and you're going to start asking mom for a dna test you know your science and you're well, even though i do take a dna test how should i how could i trust it exactly, exactly. It's very good point. It, could, it could be contaminated who's telling you the result of the dna test and yeah. is he, has he been hired yeah, they, Could they be mom? altered? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So sure. unless you do it yourself. And who's taught you how to do it? Maybe they've taught you, oh, that number is the opposite of the number it should be. So you can't necessarily win. So I see like you're looking around, is, it, is this something that's landing? Is this something that you're like, you know what, damn, a lot of the stuff relies on testimony. Mm -hmm. Sure. Good. So again, it, it's just going in line with faith. Yeah. And we do rely on faith. But some things make more sense than other things. And that's why, that's where we have the rational capability. Yeah, like I can make a prediction. I can make a prediction, you're a sensible person, and you come with a few brothers, you're gonna leave the park from that direction and not that direction. Yeah. I can make that inference sure. to the most rational, because I'm thinking he's with a few brothers, maybe they're gonna eat, they're gonna have to travel, going to a park, in an hour's time, it doesn't make sense jumping over, it's, it's, it's irrational. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I haven't got any indication that they have to go somewhere, so that is the logical way for them to exit the park. A probability. Yeah, probability. Yeah. So the inference to the best probability. Yeah. yeah. Or possibility. So we come to this point. When you see Nick, every single religion claiming that there is a holy book, yeah, every single religion claiming that there is a prophet, whether it's a religion that's coming from nowadays or whether it's a bit, you know, in the past or whether it's someone uh, 1400 years ago or 2000, 3000 years ago, regardless. Yeah. So our common sense suggests that they can't all just be picking up something random and just going with it. Sure. There has to be some form of truth that we can derive from there. But then the question would be, how would I determine which, which one? holy book? Yeah. yeah, which holy book is correct? Now I'm going to put this to you, Nick, and we'll let you lead me now. We're going to 
be my leader. Okay. Yeah? So Nick, you tell me what criteria would you have for a book that you can say this, okay, the, this book for it to be from God has to have this criteria. Um, proof and evidence that stuff in there is correct. Um, where it came from. And yeah, that's proven evidence is the big one for me. Evidence. Yeah. Let's break down evidence. What sort of evidence? Well, like, I need I need to not be skeptical that it's true, right? That's basically it. I need to know so as something... much as possible for certain that it's, it's okay. true. Okay. So what you've said is subjective. Okay. Yeah? It's something that I can see to be true, but we need to think objectively. So give me something objectively that anybody that you can tell this criteria to somebody and be like, that's the sort of criteria you need to be looking for. If you get stuck, I can help you out, but I'd rather that it came from you. I well, don't feel pressure. Ob objectively, I don't really know. like, Because everyone subjectively has their own beliefs and ideas of what needs to have, be in the criteria. That's, true, that's, that's actually true. Yeah, very true, very true. But what do you think about this as an objective criteria? Sure. If somebody is claiming that their book is from God, mm -hmm. that they have the answers for, to the universe and everything, yeah. then surely that book can't be changed. There has to be a way that it's preserved. Mm. Would you say yeah. that that's a criteria? Sure. Okay. What if I was to say to you that out of the Abrahamic faiths and the ancient religions, Islam is the only religion well, yeah. that makes that claim? Yeah. That gives us one point, yeah? So we're up by one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So in terms of preservation, do you, you're probably familiar with some of them. If you want, I can go over some of them. It's up to you. Um, go over some of. So how the Quran is preserved. Preserved. Um, go go over them. Okay, I'll just bullet point it. Sure. Yeah. So one way it's preserved is manuscript evidence. Yeah, that we can find manuscripts that are dated to the time of the quote-unquote founder, although we don't believe the Prophet Muhammad is a founder. So it's dated to the time of the Prophet and it's located in an objective place in the world. Not a Muslim country, not under Muslims, objective place. And that is in this country. Yeah, yeah, you told me this last time. Last yeah. time. Yeah, so that's the manuscript that's in the University of Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. Uh, dated to the time of the Prophet. Number one, good, done. Number two, it's... Uh, orally, orally. Orally. Yeah, so orally, how has it been produced? Yeah, sorry, uh, preserved. Preserve. And that is through memorization. That Islam is the only, and Muslims are the only ones that make the claim that we memorize the Quran en masse. Approximately, we have 11 million people that have memorized the Quran. You might be thinking, whoa, maybe you're using some Sherlock Holmes mind palace. You know, <laughs> technique, uh, and you're using all these. No, 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 no. These are minimum six year old kids that are memorizing the Quran, mm. and that's how the Quran is being preserved. Yeah, in fact, we just finished Ramadan, and in Ramadan, the Quran was recited, and there was a little clip going around of a little kid correcting a, a, an Imam that was twice his age. So, this is the like, I can say something, I'll make a mistake right now, he'd be able to correct me over a thousand times. In like, in, you know, if there have been thousands of Ramadans, it has been an ongoing process of yeah. engaging with the Quran orally, um, and that's very powerful. I, I would with say. regards to other books, they were copied. Mistakes came in, then yeah. somebody else copied, and then they copied the mistake and they introduced their own mistakes, and like that. That process is called uh, periblepsis and homo utilitan. So like Chinese is, whispers. No? Uh, not Chinese whispers. Those two techniques are, you know, if two lines end with the same word, well, yeah. sometimes when you're really tired, you skip a line because both of them end with the, the same, same word. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so because of that, these are only two ways that the Quran has been preserved. Yeah, that, that we can prove. The third is the chain of narration, but I might, I'll delve into that when I talk about the Prophet peace be upon him. Yeah. So that's the preservation of the Quran. Number two. You said, okay, with regards to what it mentions in there, yeah? So, when it comes to what's mentioned in there, now, the question that you had when we were on the side was you were saying in terms of science. Now, as Muslims, we don't believe that the science that's mentioned in the Quran is 
the science because remember we've just discussed that science by its nature continuously changes there was a time where again in the Quran it mentions that the earth is moving it's orbiting but the scientists and the people at that time said ah look at you backwards people you think that the Quran that the Sun is orbiting it's not orbiting however later we came to the know. Sun is orbiting yeah the Sun is in orbit yes the Sun is actually orbiting the Milky Way galaxy oh yeah okay. yeah so oh. it's alongside the planets and the and moons its own and axis comets. yeah it's, it's it has its own orbit so we didn't know that before so yeah. science would say ah oh, that's it you know that's fine people at the time of Isaac Newton they said oh that's it Bernard I forgot his name over there as well the one that Dawkins mentions um, Bernard something uh, he's a philosopher an atheist philosopher like, Bernard, probably Bernard something, I don't know. So he Bernard said, Lewis. No, no, Bernard Lewis is, uh, sorry. Bern no, 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 Bernard, Bernard Russell. Bernard Russell, of course. Bernard Russell, Bernard yeah. Russell. So he said, look, we've discovered everything when it comes to science and physics. Time to move on. That was Newtonian physics. Oh. Then Einstein came along with his parting, hair parting and his eccentric look. And he brought relativity yes. and it threw New Newtonian physics out of the water. Yeah. And then now they're saying quantum mechanics is ready to throw it out the water. water. Yeah. The point that I'm trying to say is it's constantly changing. So when we use science, Nick, to measure the Quran, I would say it's it's unfair. It's unfair. And the reason being it's unfair is because think about it. If the Quran was only filled with facts that you were supposed to find out 1400 years after, what about the people at that time when they don't have neutron uh, electron microscopes and they don't have Hub Hubble telescopes and they don't know what red shift is and all this sort of stuff? How are you going to explain to a Bedouin what red shift is? For him, red shift is when someone cuts him and blood goes in that direction instead of that direction. Mm. Do you see? Yeah. So it's about practicality as well. So when it comes to preservation of the Quran, when it comes to the rationality behind the Quran, it stands head and shoulders above the rest. Now I'm welcoming you to give me a counter to that with regards to what I've said so we can kind of solidify this. Um, well, you said that you couldn't tell Bedouins um, like the scientific stuff that happened. Uh, Say that again? Said, you said um, with the red shift, yes. uh, it took an example. You can tell them um, this, yes. like science. Sorry. Yeah, you can't explain yeah. to a Bedouin 1400 years ago what red shift is. Yeah. I think I know what point you were going to make. And correct me, I'll try and make it for you. And if I have made it, tell me up. If you've made yeah. it, if you haven't, say no. So I, I can put it into words. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem, that's fine. So some people think that whenever the Quran talks about science, it's unambiguous. This is false. Anytime the Quran talks about science, it is ambiguous. Yeah. Why is it ambiguous? So it can be understood by people of all times. It can be understood by people 1400 years ago, a Bedouin in a village, and it can be understood by a scientific professor that's there with his Microsoft, sorry, with with his uh, electron microscope, yeah. microscope looking into the. So you're saying it can be universally understood? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. that's that's a claim that we make yeah. as Muslims that this is something that is universal. It's something that is till the end of time. And it's something that is for everybody. So, and, in, yeah. and we had this conversation early on. I'm uh, not early on, but many times with loads of people who have like problems with the Quran in particular. That when we say ambiguous, they are translated as unclear. Ambiguous just means many meanings. There's one word that you can interpret in many many mm, ways. Yes, that's point. what that's what ambiguous here, here yeah, means. Very good, yeah, yeah. Not it doesn't mean it's not unclear. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, that that's the thing. Like some people, and this is where you you're talking about the the, the flatness of the earth. Now, this is something that Islam and Christianity. This is where we diverge. Yeah, because Islam doesn't categorically make that statement at all. In fact, one person made the argument about the, the carpet. But he was using an English uh, translation. If you look at the Arabic, the Arabic yeah. word is actually it's like a spring, yeah. And the word is when you're wrapping a turban around something, yeah. So it's actually a circular object that it goes around. So a lot of people think they rely on the English translation, but English translation is like, yeah. it's like baggy, it's like baggy trousers. Like it's not gonna. It tells you roughly I've got two legs. 
but it doesn't tell me the exact dimension of my I love, legs. I love that. Sure. I love that. Uh, yeah? Come on. That example Come is on, a beautiful though. example. <laughs> so, um, in that sense, uh, some people think that the Quran has errors in it, but it's, it's, it's completely wrong because they don't understand and this is where there's a the science that emerges from the Quran, which is called Usul. Yeah? And also Tafsir as well. So Usul are principles principles that are derived and you know to, to understand Islam we learn the usuls and principles so does this make sense to you that the Quran is unique in its preservation in its content compared to say Christianity hmm, the New Testament any educated Christian will not say that it is word for word revealed by God and is preserved I would say yeah it's the best preserved sure okay great now now let's let's, let's go to the prophet now yeah so you've got Guru Nanak you've got Vishnu Krishna you've got Jesus you've got all sorts of people yeah let's deal with the prophet Muhammad please, please, please. Okay. yeah one way of doing it is evidence. What's the evidence? Well, firstly, where's the grave of Jesus? I don't know. Where's the grave of Moses? I don't know. Where's the grave of Prophet Muhammad? I also don't. Medina. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Out of all the prophets, the Prophet Muhammad's grave, a Muslim will not only mention where it is, but a Muslim will be able to tell you the color of the dome that's above it, They'll be able to tell you the city, they'll be able to tell you the dynamics. Yeah. yeah? It's accepted, yeah? It's in Medina. Wasn't Jesus a prophet in uh, Islam? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We accept that. Sure. But what we're saying is using the same, because you're talking about evidence and skepticism, I'm saying if they, because we accept Jesus because we're told to by the prophet. Mm -hmm. Because once we verify that the Quran is correct, God is there, the Prophet Muhammad, etc., etc., then we're told certain things, and we accept that solely because of the reliability of the source that came from. But okay. Christians, they will struggle. They will struggle. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to be a big problem for them. You want to say something? Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, the the whole skepticism um, sort of tracing back where that comes from. You know, uh, Nietzsche talks about uh, genealogies of ideas and tracing them. You see, like the skepticism. You like Nietzsche. Do. I, I, I can appreciate him too for mm -hmm. some yeah. stuff he talks about. Although I don't agree, I fully agree with him. But Nietzsche, he did not like Christianity. Yeah, he was very Yeah, staunch, I don't like it either. Yeah. But he really liked Islam. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't fully agree for the reasons why he did, but yeah, it's yeah, true. He did, <laughs> and I can show you, it's in the book Antichrist, the, his book Antichrist, and I've got screenshots to it and I'll send it to you. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. But because I, I had a feeling that I might come across somebody like yourself, so I asked Yusuf. I was like, "Look, send me the things," and he went through it because Nietzsche was a big fan of, of Muslims and Muslim rulership. He was unhappy with the Christians. In fact, he didn't even like Christians challenging Islam because he didn't think that they were bringing anything new to the table. No. Yeah. 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 I also agree with that. Yeah. yeah. But um, so the the the, the skepticism that like, it, it, it is a direct. Sort of like you're inheriting basically uh, a, a, a mode of thinking that has to do with how a religious class in Europe for a very, very long time behaved yeah. and in fact misbehaved and the way they were treating their own uh, uh, scientists, Galileo, uh, Frank, Fra Francis uh, uh, Bruno and, and, and these uh, Renaissance men who were uh, brutalized by the church because they were inquisitive, you know. So like the skepticism comes really from there. And it's not, like many would claim, sort of a, a descent from the Greek skepticism, you know, the, yeah. the, the Greek philosophers who were in, indulging in skepticism to arrive to what they believe was true. It comes more from a, a place of, of trauma and pain. And I don't think that you should then apply that to every single uh, religious tradition. Um, because, and this is very famous, if you look at medieval Islamic uh, Baghdad or other places, the uh, relationship between the scientist and the religious class, um, they don't agree on everything, but that I, that no one is burning at stake. <laughs> Right, there's no one is burning at stake, yeah. and and I think that's where it comes from. So when you when and I always see this to my friends and atheists and, and Christian, when you approach Islam, you have to kind of like leave that 
to the side for a moment and entertain and criticize or engage with what it, whatever, whatever is in front of you as to go to this whole skepticism thing that was born out of um, uh, the Enlightenment period, which is really pretty much um, uh, you know, a byproduct uh, of the French Revolution and what comes after. Uh, I think it would be very important. Yeah. It, it just opens you up, you know, it just opens you up to more um, possibilities to think and be more elastic with your thinking, you know. Sure. You mentioned B Benjamin Russell and things like that. All these people, or even like Nietzsche or Ludwig Feuerbach, they don't even have, and I've heard this before and I find this very interesting, they don't necessarily have a problem with religion. They have a problem with the philosophy of religion. Yeah. Right, they're criticizing the philosophy that comes with religion. So it's not necessarily theology, because a lot of the things that Nietzsche talks about, about Christianity and the theology, I'm like, mm, you kind of get it wrong here because you're not really engaging with the theology, you're more engaging with the philosophy. And I think that's sometimes the problem. If you just look plainly at the philosophy yeah. um, or theology in Islam and discuss that, I find it very difficult because you seem to be very open-minded and sincere. I find it very difficult to, to disagree with the things that are in there. So Nick, just like we did with the Quran, yeah. let's do the same thought experiment. Let's just love the experiments. Let's do a thought experiment with the Prophet. Mm -hmm. What's your criteria for you to accept that a person is a Prophet? Yeah, what criteria? Um, well, they have like a large amount of knowledge, way more than other people on the subject, and are able to teach, you know, effectively. That's your main criteria, yeah? Sure, yeah. Okay. So the criteria... Um, can I just dispose of that for you? Thanks a lot. So one of the criteria that I would say, and again it comes down to preservation, you're seeing a trend now that Islam mm. is the only one that's solving this issue of preservation. Yeah. When it comes to preservation, how do you know what Jesus said? And if that was 2000 years ago, how can you verify that? How can you verify what Moses said 2000 years ago? You can't. How can you verify what the Prophet Muhammad peace of God said 1400 years ago? Because it, it was preserved. It was preserved. Yeah. How, how can, can you say how, what Nietzsche said? How can you, how can you verify that? Because Nietzsche, and uh, I'm using Nietzsche as an yeah, example yeah. here. Yeah. Nietzsche... You don't move from there to here. Oh. You don't move just yeah. back yeah. here. Oh. Yeah. Nietzsche... Uh, and, and, and sorry, and you can carry on. I'm no, just, no, I just no, wanted no. to mention this. No. Nietzsche was forgotten at one point in the European philosophical mind. And there was someone like uh, the name of Kaufmann who digs up um, his uh, the archival stuff because Nietzsche became uh, a philosopher for, for fascism and the Nazis had um, what's it called hijacked Nietzsche yeah. and, and, and uh, his sister and whatever, what comes after it. But it's someone like Kaufmann. So, you see, this idea of preservation, it's very, very at the heart of everything that we engage in. So, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very difficult. That's why we've got carbon dating. You yeah. can't take people's word for it. That's why things have to be carbon dated. And even then, how can yeah. you carbon dated that it's of that period, but how do you know what that person's written is the truth? Yeah. So that's very difficult to tell. But in Islam, we have something called the chain of transmission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is something that is unique to Islam. No Christian, no Jew, no Hindu, no Sikh, no Jain, no Scientologist will be able to bring something as what well, Scientology is very fairly recent, but any of the classical ancient religions, none of them profess to having something as robust as this. Yeah. Yeah. There is something similar amongst the Buddhists, it's called Dharma transmission, but it isn't. Uh, in, it's in, not. In you know why? I'll tell you why. Because yeah. get off. Spiders, spiders, spiders. Ah, spider, yes. I saw Spider-Man recently as well. Yeah. But if he gets bitten, it's okay. At least yeah. he can start yeah, saving was, the world. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, with heroes, we get villains as well. The higher the hero becomes, the higher the villain he needs to combat him as well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, with regards to um, preservation of hadith, for us to take a narrator. There's so much information that Islam requires for us to take and there's so much information that's required for us to even accept that narrator that
but it makes it very improbable for us to deny that. Yeah. So we will know obviously the name of the person that's narrated it. We will know their tribe. We will know who they studied with. We will know when they studied. Were they there at that time when they existed? Were they say were they there where they say they were there? Were they there where they said they were there? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. And how's their memory? Are they a liar? Do they lie? How's their reputation in the community? That's already seven criteria. Yeah. Now Nick, I'm about to blow your mind, yeah? Okay. Okay, you ready, yeah? Sure. Okay, no explosives, don't worry. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, I can give you a saying of the Prophet, and I can tell you the people in the chain. Yeah. I'm going to one step forward. I'll give you what the Prophet said in Arabic, I'll translate it for you, and I'll tell you every single person in that chain. So the Prophet said the nearest meaning, that means a person will be with whom he loves. Okay. So if you love somebody, you respect them, you value them, you'll be with them in Jannah, in Paradise. I've been stalking that. Yeah? So, this. Thanks, Dawood, you're exposing your sin. I know. So, Al Maru Ma'aman Ahab. We heard this. Yeah? We heard this from Imam, we read it compiled by Imam Ahmad. Mm -hmm. Imam Ahmad tells us that he narrated it from Hushayn. Hushayn narrated, narrated it from Humayd At-Tawil. Humayd At-Tawil narrated it from Anas ibn Malik. And Anas ibn yeah. Malik narrated it from Muhammad. Yes. The, film, the film was called... Um, every single person, every single person in this chain, I can tell you their name, I can tell you their father, I can tell you their tribe. Yeah. yeah. And that's the level. Now you might be thinking, mm, that's that's impressive. Five. Yeah. yeah, five. I can shorten that. There's one compiler, he calls it the golden chain. When he finds only three people in the chain. Imam Malik's uh... Ima, uh, yeah, Imam Bukhari also calls it his his golden chain. Yeah. So Enough, the Prophet yeah, yeah, the Prophet peace be upon him said to the nearest meaning. He told us not to kill women and children. How do, how do we know this? Well, we get this from Imam Malik in his book, The Muatta. Mm -hmm. Check all this out, it's all recorded. Sure. Yeah? Imam Malik gets it from Muatta. He gets it from Nafi. Nafi gets it from Abdullah bin Umar. And Abdullah bin Umar gets it from the Prophet. Prophet. Yes. Yeah. That's the three. Three people in that chain. Again, we know there's pages upon pages. In fact, I, I don't think I'd be wrong if I say there's a book written on Nafi. There's a book written on... There's a book, there's a book, there's a book written by Imam Malik. There's a book written on Imam Malik, on uh, Nafi, on Abdullah bin Umar, and of course on the Prophet. Yeah. Yeah. Books, not even name, family, tribe, memory, reputation. No, no. And it's, it, is, it is the same with the Quran. So we have Mujahid, and then it goes to Ibn Abbas, and it goes again back to the Prophet. You know, one thing that people like to say it's, um, oh, Imam Bukhari comes 200 years after, not knowing that 100 years, 150 years, 200 years in, in historical context is nothing. 100 years or 200 years, which means my, grand, my great grandfather. You know, that's the distance yeah. between. 200 years yeah. is just. It, yeah, my great grandfather. Yeah, it's it's still in the lifetime of certain indiv in, individuals, and, and and that I've been looking to um, recently quite closely. It's extremely fascinating how Islam, uh, an early Islam, is so well preserved that we have all the characters who are the building blocks of this religion. And to me, that is. Uh, a, a proof why I believe in Islam also. It's just because it's been, like you said, well preserved to such an and extent. And I think Nick also, to add on to that is, the thing is, when it comes to proof and, and history and evidence, it's something that comes second nature for us. But I have a coin at home, I was supposed to bring it. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I got it from uh, Adnan Rashid, he gifted it to me. And that coin is 150, 140 years after the Prophet. Wow. And in a month's time, he's, he's 
going to get me on that. I don't want to say it because some people might be thinking, but I'm yet to get a coin. I'm planning on getting a coin. I've seen his one. I want to have one personally so I can just whip it out and go, Nick, have a look at this. That is dated at the time of the Prophet. And that's something that Muslims have in, in, in their homes. Yeah, that's something that's excavated you have in our homes. Yeah. When you go to German museums, they have uh, books on Sira and Hadith that are dating back hundreds and hundreds of years. And this is something that is unique to Islam. When you're talking evidence, look at the Kaaba. You know the black stone that Muslims go around in Mecca? Yeah. 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 That's another ev evidence of Islam with carvings on the rock that have been checked and carbon dated. This is something that again is evidence for Islam. So when it comes to evidence, Nick, it's, it's something that Islam is replete with. And the mere fact, I'm going to bring it back to this point, the mere fact that I'm able to stand here and link a chain, the, the Arabic of what the Prophet said, translate that for you from the native language because Nick, Arabic is a live language. This is another way yeah, that, the, that the Quran is preserved. Jesus spoke Aramaic. It's not a live no, language. Yeah. Hebrew. It's there, but it's not a live it language. It was revived. Yeah, it was revived. Yeah. And Arabic is in the top five most languages spoken on the planet. No other religion can give you like, oh, but Hinduism. No, not, not Sanskrit though. That's what the Vedas written in. Yeah, okay. Uh, your different languages, Hindi, all right, cool, you can have that. But what about Sanskrit? Okay, that's where the problem is. Aramaic, okay, Hebrew, okay, that's where the problem is. Yeah. Arabic, live language, top five in the world. People speak it on the street like it's nothing. Yeah. You can go on Google and translate it. So get, try to get stuff translated in Aramaic. I mean, with all the respect, like, who cares? No one, no one speaks Aramaic. So stuff like this, Nick, when you put all the evidence together, highlight, you look at Islam, you have to go like this, you might get whiplash. All the evidence that's piled up, whiplash. Yeah. But when you look at other religions, it's not the same. Like, you'll be speaking with Christians as well, and you'll be talking about the New Testament, and they will tell you, Nick, can I call you Nick? They'll say, to get on your side, when you make this point about preservation of the New Testament, they don't, they don't accept that. In fact, the academics, how many times have you been here for time? The legitimate from amongst them say, look, we don't say it's preserved. We say the meaning has been passed on for generations. But meaning is open to interpretation. Yeah. Center is open to biases and meaning itself is not something that can be verified empirically. Or contained in the language, contained yeah. in Interpretation is subjective. Precisely. Yeah. There, yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. There you go. But, and, and if I want to check it, how, how do I check the veracity of that? Can I carbon date it? Can I check? No. But can I carbon date the Quran? Yes. Yeah. Can I carbon date the tafsirs and the, the interpretations that came after? Yes, 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 yes. All of them, yes. Yeah. That's why, Nick, the question comes again to you. What is it going to take for you to finally accept Islam? Again, it's the thought experiment again. <laughs> I don't know, actually. I don't. I, 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 that's a very honest answer. Yeah. Because you've listened to a, a lot today, and the only thing I ask of you is the, the heart, keep it open. Yeah. Nietzsche appreciated this. He didn't throw Islam and Muslims with the Christians. And Whenever I've mentioned that, you say, I also agree with that. I do. Yeah. And that's why, Nick, I want you to adopt this as well and say, don't throw all religions in one container and one box. Yeah. I want you to say, I'm sorry. Like, I've been speaking to you, the Christian, I've been speaking to you, the Hindu, the Sikh. But when it comes to chain of transmission, when it comes to preservation, when it comes to practical rulings, for example, look, Nick, when I even talk about prophecies of the Prophet, I'll give you a prophecy right now, free sure. of charge now. <laughs> prophet, peace be upon him, at his time, he was witnessing the Byzantines losing. The Persians were violating them, abusing them. Yeah. 
like it was happy days. A plague broke out amongst the Byzantines. No one in their right mind would say, yeah, these dons are going to be winning now. Now, if you look at anybody, I gave you a book, Forbidden Prophecies, last time. Yeah. So, in that same book, Forbidden Prophecies, you see whenever the safest way, even these um, uh, psychics, psychics, yeah. psychics, whenever they want to give like a prophecy or something, they cold read. Yeah, like I, I can cold read you and, and give you a, a uh, prophecy that's tailored to you. So the Prophet peace be upon him, his prophecy is specific and it can be checked even by non-Muslims. So, the Byzantines at that time were losing, they were break, breaking out and everything. The Prophet peace be upon him came along and said, within up to nine years, the Byzantines are going to beat the Persians. People are like, hang on a minute. The Persians are stronger, bigger, de decimating these Byzantines. Who is he to come along and say that, oh, the Byzantines are going to win and they're going to win within nine years. Now you might be thinking, all right, fine, that's probably you Baidis and that weird guy there making that noise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's just coming amongst you guys. But no, and this, is, this is a good one. This can be verified through a non-Muslim source dated back to that time for the Chronicles of Theophanes. I mentioned this to you last time as well. I think, the yeah. Chronicles of Theophanes, yeah, which is a non-Muslim that could date back to that time, say, yes, the Byzantines and the Persians were in a war. Yes, the Byzantines were losing. And yes, the Byzantines did eventually win. Yeah, and then the Byzantines did actually win. So this is a prophecy that not only is specific, it's time bound, but this is something that is mentioned in the Quran, something which is preserved through chain of narration and something that's verified by a non-Muslim don called Theophilus. Mm. He's written a book called Chronicles. It's chronicled whatever was going on at that time. Yeah. Again, Nick, this is something that as Muslims, we will give you loads of these. But when you speak to a Christian, that, they can't give you anything. that is something that you can say, yes, but this is based upon faith. But how do you test this? And I can tell you, you can use empirical methods, carbon dating to check manuscripts. I can tell you that you can check the science of hadith preservation. Check it, no problem. Not yeah. hiding anything. I'll come here next time, inshallah, I'll have the coin with me. And you can check where, when and when it's been minted. Yeah. So these. Well, with the with the carbon dating, it's like this similar to the DNA test with my mom. How do you know that it's not altered or something? Yeah. So the thing is, <laughs> so very good point. But the thing is, look, this is something that what I'm saying is somebody that comes with science. This is something that they'd have to contend with because their criteria is so stringent. When it comes to religion, we're saying apply that stringent criteria to science, and you will struggle. We as Muslims, we say, look, we're practical people. Yeah, we know that we need a degree of testimony and stuff yeah. like that. But if something goes against something that's in the Quran, which is unambiguous, which you know can't be interpreted here and there, we take the Quran. Because the testimony for the Quran, well, according to the science of the Quran, is stronger than that of science. I mean, which book of science will you say, oh, here is the chain of narrators of the, the theory of um, radioactivity from Mary Curie. Oh, this narrator is weak and this... None of that, mate. It's in the book. The book can be misprinted. The book can be printed by somebody else. You know, for example, there was a book, George Orwell. Yeah. Uh, Animal Farm. Animal Farm, yeah, I read Animal it. Farm. Yeah. What they did was they made a cartoon of Animal Farm. Yeah. But then, this is accepted by the CIA. Because the whole Russia business, ironically, was going on then as well, but though they were Soviet Union. They changed the ending of Animal Farm in the cartoon. They changed it. But in the book, it's different. What did they change it to in the cartoon? They changed it to something that was a bit more favorable to uh, the, the American narrative. So an adaptation more than one-to-one. Yeah, -one, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so we see that there is no such thing as chain of narration and stuff like that. Because, because you shut your mouth, boy!
So you, you, you did say that you're an atheist, or you identify as an atheist slash agnostic, right? Yeah. Well, those of you guys that are um, watching, uh, I'm not saying... I would say, personally, sort of, of like... It's me, it's me. Say <laughs> if there was a point and you decide to be like, well, okay, look, let me look into this, and actually I'll be like, rah, actually, you know what, like, it kind of does make sense to believe in a god. I think what would it do for you, subjectively, right, is that Islam is a religion that encourages you to become the best possible you. Come on. It encourages you to be the best possible you in any uh, given circumstance. And I feel like if you look at, uh, at you know, the existing, um, you know, people like Albert Camus and, and Franz Kafka, you know, all these like, there's no meaning in life and so the type of thing. You have to like carve out your own meaning. I feel like you're intelligent enough perhaps to do that. But what about the person who isn't really well educated? How is he going to carve out this purpose in life, right? That's why this Islam is a universal, a universal invitation for you to embrace who you are as a person, you know, and further de develop you as a, as a human being. And unfortunately, there's been so much bad press about religion. And remember, I was telling you about skepticism and where it actually comes from. There's been loads of bad press about religion. But what religion actually does, or what Islam is, is claiming to do to you, is that it will direct your focus to a place where you can be more comfortable and your surroundings can be more comfortable and it changes the surroundings. So sure. I am inviting you to become one of us so that we can make this world to a better place because I, I really like your decorum i really like the way you behave you went up obnoxious you're really listening and and and, and you're very inquisitive so learn more and, yeah. and, and and embrace islam yeah well thank you for talking to me today again my pleasure nick my like, pleasure it's always a pleasure come on yeah as soon as i saw you and any question that you have i have a feeling you you have to go now yeah yeah i do yeah, yeah. okay great yeah. i got that from my body language <laughs> so nick pleasure any questions okay you can contact me sure yeah, yeah. and hopefully we'll meet again next time yeah and i ask you just to do one thing and that is when you go home when you're by yourself you know before going to sleep if i go to bed a bit early like i don't know when you're like totally zoned just a bit where you can just sit in bed and i want you to any way that possible raise your hand like that but like that and say god Wherever you are, whoever you are, if you're there, guide me. I really need this. Yeah, I'm, I've stood in the park with two wonderful brothers, one more yeah. wonderful than the other. <laughs> <laughs> the other one, bones withering away, eroding in the, in the atmosphere, and say, look, I'm doing what I can from my side. And Nick, I promise you, I put my hand on my heart, I can verify this. If you're sincere, there's no way. I'm actually not worried. Yeah. yeah. You will be guided by God. Because God does not let the people that want to be guided be unguided. So everything that you've had today, nice little discussion that we've had. Now I want you to do something because we believe that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience. experience. Yeah. So we're spiritual beings. So now I want you to resonate with that, raise your hand and tap into that energy. You know, like radio frequency. Yeah. When you tap, when you go to 94.6 or whatever it is, oh, then, you, yeah, then you get whatever it is. So similarly, I want you to tune in in the frequency of God and say, God, I'm tuned in. Help me. That's all I want you to do, mate. Hey, man. Thanks, I appreciate that. Thank you for allowing me to be Yeah, part. no, of course. It's fine, yeah. Thanks. Um, should I put...